Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me this morning. So we are going to talk about the Battle of the Castel, um, six days in 1948. And I am assuming that everybody knows where it is, but just in case, it's basically eight to 10 kilometers west of Yerushalayim, um, right at Niva Seretzion. Um, before I continue, I wanted to explain to you what I'm hoping that you'll get out of this presentation. One is to learn a little bit about the history um, and also how to guide the site. And lastly, I hope that you have a greater appreciation for the site, A, from an Israeli perspective and B, from a guiding perspective. And before I continue, I just want to share something about myself when I'm guiding. I think for me, I can't speak for anybody else, but one of the challenges in Israel is helping to share the history of Israel, which in many cases involves war, but also making it fun and exciting and meaningful. So I'm always trying to balance the fact that we have had to engage in battle a lot, but also be able to present the joy at what we've been able to achieve. Um, and I actually think the Castell is one of the great places to do that. So I'm going to get right into it. Um, people will often ask, okay, is there any biblical connection to this particular piece of land? And the answer is probably. Um, if you read the chapters of Yehoshua where um, B'nai Israel is being apportioned the land, um, in Perek um, Petvav, it says, um, and the border was drawn from the top of the mountain unto the fountain of the west and went to, out to the cities of Har Ephron, Mount Ephron, which is, most people believe is where Mivaseret sits today. And the border was drawn to Bala in Kiryat Ya'arim. So there is, if anybody is curious, there is a biblical connection. And for me, I think it's always important, even if, if you're not at a site that is very obviously connected to the Bible, I always think that it's important to make that connection for people so that people understand that we're not just here for 20 years, 40 years, 100 years, but that our history in every corner of the country has a very deep connection. And that's why, at least for me, I always like to make that connection for people, even when they're not expecting it. Um, who built here? The Romans built here. The Crusaders built here. It's abandoned for a long time, but then we have the remains of the Mukhtar's house from the Ottoman period. That's at the top. And by the way, for those of you who haven't had the chance to go up there, the views are spectacular. Hot, because there isn't a lot of shade, but absolutely spectacular. Um, okay. The other thing that's really important for me when I'm going to a battle site is to paint a picture so that the people who I'm guiding understand that this didn't happen in a bubble. There was a whole world or a whole country or the building of a country going on around. And this is just looking through a magnifying glass at one particular spot. But I always like people to have a sense that this was part of a much bigger picture. Um, and when I'm guiding at Castel, I remind people of the Balfour Declaration, when it said that His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. And if I have time, sometimes I'm at Castel a short amount of time and sometimes it's long, I ask people, where's the little trick in the statement and they don't usually get it and that's fine but to talk about the difference between a national home and a state and what was going on with the british they're trying to balance their own needs with the arabs needs with the jews needs and this was playing with words and to help people understand that even with the balfour declaration there was no stability for the jewish people in the homeland until they took it Upon themselves to gain stability. In November of 47, going 30 years later, we have the United Nations General Assembly approving the partition plan, and immediately the next day, 
the war erupts. But it's really important for people to understand that it's not that it was all peaceful before November 30th. We use that as a point in time because of that's the first day that there's battle after the United Nations has approved a plan for giving us a homeland. Not the land that we wanted, not all of it, but giving us something. So again, depending on time, you can refer back to um, 33, you know, 30, 33, 39, going back to the 20s actually in Savron. It's kind of up to you. But again, to help people understand that it's not that the Jews living um, in what was then the British mandate uh, were having it an easy time. The other thing that I think is really important to point out before talking about the site itself is remember that the Castel was one of a series of communities that needed to be um, conquered in order to protect the Jewish community of Jerusalem. At that point, there are about 165,000 people living in Jerusalem. 100,000 of them are Jewish. Most of them are poor. Most of them, um, whatever. It, they don't have a lot of money. Living conditions are not easy. and um, without the Castel, without some of the other places like Neve Ilan, Malay Hamisha, the chances of holding on to Jerusalem were very, very slim. Um, and I also like to talk about the fighters themselves because I, and this is where I think pictures really make a really huge impact because we think about wars being fought by armies. And we weren't really an army. I mean, we were as well trained as we could be. We had the um, Haganah, founded in 1920, and then the, the Palmach, which is the, the striking force, is in 1941. But we're not a full-fledged army with proper uniforms. We don't all have the same ammunition and, all, and the same guns, little guns that we have. But I do want to make another point when I speak to people. In no, I'm sorry, in December, the beginning of December of 1947, the Haganah had roughly 12,000 soldiers. By the end of that month, there were 15,000, 25% increase in one month. That, you know, you say 12,000, 15,000, it doesn't sound like a, not a lot until you do the percentages. And the question is, how is there this jump? And a lot of that has to do with the Pamach, because during this time, the Palmach helped 65 ships land on the shores. Not all of the people who landed made it. Some of them wound up in Atli, and that's a story for a different time. But they were also helping people come in by foot, Jews from Syria and Lebanon. And what I, why I find this really important to communicate to people is this is December 1947, April, is the battle at Castel. You have people who barely speak the language. Um, they've been through hell. Uh, hell is a nice way to put it. it. These are people who are not strong. Some of them are, some of them are, are, were born in Israel and we'll talk about them. But when you think about the achievements, they, it would have been remarkable under a well-trained unified army. But I like to show pictures of people that I'll show more later to help people understand who, the, who we're talking about, who these fighters were. Um, I also want to talk about the Castel itself. The Castel um, becomes a target because there were, I'll just show you on a map, bear with me. Um, I don't know if you can see, if you, I apologize, I'm not grabbing my arrow properly. Castel, the Castel is on the, sort of the top of your screen, but there were Arab villages in Sataf, which is just a little bit further south. Um, in, um, I'm sorry, in, in Karim and also in Suba. So that there was a tremendous pressure to hold on to the castel because it was so surrounded um, by Arab villages.
And I just want to point out that Ben-Gurion is very, very worried about the fate of Jerusalem. And when you're hiking through um, the Casa, when you're reaching the top, it's really nice because they have maps and they have little quotes along the way. And it even quotes Ben-Gurion saying the fall of Jerusalem would be a death to this whole project. So he understands the importance. So this is definitely coming from the top down. Um, and the other thing that I want to point out to people, and I know that some of you know this already, but I'm just also trying to give you some help in how to guide here, is when you're at the top and you're looking down, people can say, well, you know, there's a road there. The convoys could just get through. And what people have to remember is these convoys, because there were Arab villages on both sides of the road, they were sandwich vehicles, which meant that there was wood and then steel plating over it, which really, really slowed them down. And I love this picture because it shows the convoy and you get a sense that these were not vehicles that could go 120 kilometers an hour and they basically were sitting ducks. Near the end, we'll talk more about how that problem gets solved because the battle for the Castel was a piece of the puzzle, but not certainly not all of it. Um, okay, in terms of specific battles, we've now talked about the fact that the Balfour Declaration had been established 30 years earlier. The General Assembly, 30 years later, 1947, had established um, the partition, or had approved the partition plan, fighting breaks out. In December, you have um, a Jewish convoy attacked in Shar Haggai, which is where the convoy was going. February 1948, the leader of the Arabs in the Jerusalem area, uh, Abd al Khalda al Hussein, blocks the main road, which means that transfers could not get to Yerushalayim. On January, a convoy of 25 trucks that had actually gotten through um, were attacked on the way back. And if you read, you'll see, well, wait a minute, the British intervened, they stopped this. But it is very clear, if you read it very carefully and you look at the timelines, the British could have intervened much, much earlier. But by this point, the British had made their opinions known. And they allow the fighting to go on in January for way longer than it needed to. So it is very clear to the Haganah, to the Palmach, that they are on their own. They may have had training from the British in their history, but they are now absolutely on their own. And the other thing that inspires them is I talked about um, the people of Yerushalayim. They were poor and they were starving. And the Chubeza that we see so much in the fall, you won't see it there now. Um, the Jews of Jerusalem were so desperate for food that they were actually making soup out of Chubeza. And there was an argument over whether to broadcast the recipe on Kol Yisrael. Um, or actually pre Kol Yisrael. I read, and I don't know if somebody read something differently, I read that the decision was actually not to broadcast it because if they did, it would give um, chizuk, I guess, to um, inspiration, strength to the Arab cause because they would see how badly the Jews of Jerusalem were faring. So, um, the men and women, by the way, it wasn't only men fighting at the castle. There were two for sure, Leah Adler and Bilcha Soretsky, and I believe there was one other woman, I can't remember her name offhand, were, that fought in the battles. But it is very clear to them that the people of Jerusalem, the Jews of Jerusalem are starving. Um, I want to talk about who they're fighting. They're fighting a man named Abd al-Khadir um, Abed al-Khadr al-Husseini, excuse me, who was the commander of the Arab forces in Jerusalem. And I just want to give you a sense. He comes from a very, very prominent family in Jerusalem. He's educated in chemistry at the um, American University in Cairo. When he comes back to what was in the British Mandate of Palestine, he actually takes a job in the British government. Very important, A, because it shows how well connected he was and that initially he was very connected to the British and it also shows you that the British were very pro-Arab at that point. He ultimately 
because of Chevron decides to disassociate himself with the British and becomes independent. By the way, he actually gets kicked out by the British. He's expelled to Iraq, sneaks his way back in. He was an incredibly fierce opponent for the people of the Castel. And he was a fierce trainer. So the troops who trained under him were very well prepared. Just like to keep that in the background. Um, in April 1st, there's a very small battle, but that's not really the significant battle. And I just put this map here when you're with clients, you can, with tourists, um, you can translate. But it's just um, a great map that's actually at the Costa that again emphasizes that point that it wasn't just here that there were battles, but all around the hills of Jerusalem or outside of Jerusalem, there were battles going on. Um, April 3rd, the battle breaks out, and the commander is a man named um, Eliyahu Sela, who's known as Ranana, and I'll explain why in just a moment. He is actually born in Tel Aviv. His family moves to Ranana when he's young. He goes to the Geula Gymnasia in Tel Aviv, um, but he drops out of high school without telling his parents, every Jewish mother's dream. Um, but he joins the Haganah and he trains at um, Kiryat Anavim, which is where he became known as Ra'anana, simply because there were five Eliyahu's that were training and they had to find a way to um, differenti differentiate. So he gets known Ranana and the name sticks. Um, he's also an example of a very Tsioni family. When they come here, his parents change their name from Steinfeld to Sela. And you can also talk about how so many leaders did that when they came here. And there are people who do it today. Just so something that makes traveling in Israel and Israel's history different than maybe traveling to other countries. Um, and I also want to point out, he was born in August of 26. He gets killed at the Castel. He's um, 20, barely, uh, he's not even 22 years old when he's killed. But he is a commander. And again, emphasizing the fact that the leadership was so, so young. Um, this picture actually is not from the Castel, but I like to show it just because, you know, you talk about the fact that we didn't have enough ammunition. We didn't have enough of anything. And you see people here, one has a rifle, one has a, um, a gun. It, I just try to do it to personalize, make people just understand what's going on. So what happens is on April 3rd, um, the Palmach attacks the Castel, and there's almost nobody there. Great. They take it. It's 790 meters above sea level, important views. It's, it's a great defensive point. And this is going to be an amazing accomplishment. It happens at like 2 o'clock in the morning. April 4th, the Arabs attack. And they come in with, um, oh, I'm actually, should not. Um, that side was out of order, sorry. The Arabs come in and they attack. They start with a thousand Arabs. These are well-trained Arabs under Abd al-Khadr al, al Saini, and they are absolutely relentless. By the way, there are reports that the fighting was so exhausted. Now, I was never in Sahal. I don't know if this is something that happens in battle. Some people may not be shocked what I'm about to say. I was. That there were soldiers that were actually falling asleep during the battle itself. That's how incredibly exhausted their lives were on the line, but they had been fighting nonstop 48, 72 hours. But they, they keep going. By the way, there were additional troops. Some of the Hamas actually, when they thought that the capturing of the Castle was so easy, they leave and members of the Moria Brigade come in. That's just a little aside, but the fighting becomes absolutely relentless. The 5th, the 6th, the 7th, and then April 8th is the pivotal um, date in the battle because of an accident that was 
how you look at it was either a good thing for the Jews or not a good thing. And what happens is in the early morning hours, the members of actually at this point, the Mori Brigade see two um, Arabs walking about and they shoot them. They see them as Arabs and they shoot, no questions asked. What becomes, a cl what becomes clear very quickly is one of the dead was Abu al Khalder al Husseini himself. Um, the Arabs initially know that he's injured because they know that the fighting has continued. They know that he's there. They don't know whether he is alive or dead. And so more and more, initially, more Arab fighters come in to fight the battle. But then what happens is as they come, they realize that Husseini is actually one of the casualties this time. And that was a pivotal moment for the men and women fighting at the Castel. Um, but before I tell you why it was a pivotal moment, I want to get back to how horrible the fighting was. And in order to do that, I need to move on to another man who plays a very pivotal role on that day. And his name is Shimon Alfasi. Like, um, bear with me one second, I'm just, um, sorry, like Eliyahu Sadeh, Afasi is born in Tel Aviv. He is only a year older than Eliyahu Sadeh, um, and he um, joined the Palmach in 1942. He was very well trained, um, and the battle is horrific. People are starting to get killed. And he gives one of the most famous orders in the history of Tzahal, Torim Salaseget Hanifagdim Nisharim Lachafot. And what that means is that the privates, you retreat, we as the commanders, we are the ones who are responsible. Again, I've never served in Tzahal, but my children got that same message when they were training. And I think it's a moment to talk about the pride of Tzahal, that um, along with the privilege of being a commander, of being an officer, is also the responsibility. And he gets killed in battle. There, again, 39 people were killed, but um, he takes the responsibility that the most well-trained are the ones who have to suffer the consequences. And it was bloody on April 8th. On going into April 9th, until, um, until the Arabs realize that Husseini is one of the victims. And that becomes a turning point because they want to remove his body and they want him to be buried. Uh, he actually is buried on um, Arabayat. And in the confusion of getting the body off of the castel and getting his body to Jerusalem, a lot of the Arabs retreat. Um, two uh, trucks are able to enter the castel to resupply the people with uh, ammunition, with food, and they are able to fight and ultimately hold on to the castel. There were 39 people and their names are listed in a memorial at the very top or just below the very top. And what you, what I think is very important and Castell is not the only site where we see this, but I think that it's another opportunity to talk about how we value our soldiers here in Israel. Um, if you look at the stone closest, it's at Shlomo Rosenberg, um, Mayor Rosenblatt, Naftali Rabinovich, and um, I can't read um, the top name, but there's no rank. It's the names. And people might say, but people trained, you know, if, if they were an officer, they trained a really long time. And our answer is that we are all equal. And our rank doesn't make us any better. And when we die, in duty, when we're killed in duty, um, we're remembered as a human being. And that's the value that we place on life. 
Um, I wanted to send you or share with you um, the words from one of the most famous songs that came out of all of the fighting that happened along Bab el Wad. Um, here I walk silently and I remember them, every single one. Here we fought together over cliffs and boulders. Here we were to one family, Bob El Wad, forever do remember our names as convoys broke to the city on the roadsides lie our dead, the Iron Hulk as silent as my comrade. Um, I'm happy to play the song. Um, actually, you know, I'm just going to play it for a minute because I think there's some people on the phone call who don't know it. And I'll just play for a minute and then I'll return. Oni, to play it, you have to go to share screen and press down that you're sharing the, your, your, your sound. Okay, hold on. Uh... Go out of share screen and okay. then go back, go back in and, and you'll see on the bottom left it says share. Your computer sound. Okay, we're there. Okay, bear with me. And full screen, please. presentation with Judy so you can all see it but um, by the way I when I heard this song one of the questions that I had was why is it referred to as Bab El Wad why not Shar Haggai and apparently everybody referred to it as the Arabic name in the 40s and that's why the song that commemorates the struggles of uh, capturing all the area around it was called Bab El Wad um, so we know that the story doesn't end with the capture of the Castel. So what happens afterwards? One is that um, Operation Nachshon is uh, formed afterwards. And 
And again, always important to make the biblical connection to remind people that it's named for Nachshon ben Aminadab, the first person to step into Yam Suf uh, during the Exodus. Um, the other was, and, and um, I'm sorry, um, Operation Nachshon, the goal was to break the siege of Yerushalayim. The other thing was that it changed the strategy of the Haganah and Hamach, and they realized that stopping or trying to get through um, Shar Haggai was going to be frustration after frustration after frustration. Ultimately, they create the Burma Road, side road that we all love hiking on today, um, to bypass it, and also. It was at this point that they start to move into Arab villages, realizing that they needed to be more proactive, preemptive. And so it becomes a major, major changing point in the strategy of how the Haganah was going to fight to establish the state. Um, and large convoys for a while were able to get through. Um, what I don't know if any of you have been there in the last few years, but if you're going with a group, by the way, you cannot do this now. I asked them. It's, it's not possible right now, but it'll happen again. There are group activities that um, Rashid Hateva has organized there because they want to communicate the idea of working together and team building. Um, and they thought that um, the Casta was a good place to do that. And I actually, it's great. I did it with a group once again, let's be honest. These things are always fun, but there is a nice message that, you know, can be sent. So eventually we will have groups again. Um, you cannot just show up. You have to call ahead of time, but there are a lot of team building exercises. I've done it with a family. It was a large family bar mitzvah group. Um, but you could do it with a corporate group. I don't know if you could do it with three or four people. I can't imagine doing it with less than seven or eight. But again, uh, it's a great activity. Um, the other thing is, uh, is um, Malka, I don't think Malka today, but I was thinking of her because one of the things that happens to me, and I guess it happens to a lot of people, is as you're walking, people say, what tree is that? What tree is that? So I just want to include images of some of the trees that um, you see at the castel. You certainly see alone. You see buckthorn, which is these little small leaves, and you've got styrax, those beautiful little white flowers. Um, you also have You have figs, by the way, this time of year, I took these pictures just a few days ago, um, figs are starting to ripen, so it's a really fun time of year. You won't see this in the fall, but it's always fun when you're there. Something's always gonna be in bloom. Oh, and when you're there in the winter, by the way, there are Kalaniyo that are there. They're not, they were transplanted there, but you get a beautiful view of Kalaniyo there. Um, you have thistle, and certainly you have um, you have um, olive trees there as well. You also, by the way, have picnic um, picnic tables that are very shaded. So one thing about the castle, there is almost no shade, but there are shaded picnic tables. And the reason that I wanted to point that out is if you get to guide Israelis in the next few weeks, and that may happen, you can easily have people bring their own lunches. The tables are distant enough so that you could do a really fun picnic lunch that's shaded. And when I was there with this bar mitzvah family, they said, wow, that's so weird having picnic tables at a battle site. Um, and my response to them and I think that it's true. I mean, yes, it's shaded. It's a nice place to have a picnic. But I also think that there's something very powerful 
that even when we're having a beautiful picnic under these great trees and, and the views are phenomenal, that we don't take it for granted here, that we are easily reminded of the great place, I'm sorry, the great price that we paid. Um, that is the end of my presentation. I'm going to send the link to Judy. You are more than welcome to do with it as you want. If I'm going to just share now. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. And if I don't know the answer, I'll write it down and get back to you. And I just hope that everybody is healthy and uh, that you can enjoy the summer as best you can. Oni, can the... I can I contribute something? Please, Lauren. Uh, I have a neighbor in Beta Karim in his now ladies, and he tell he fought there, and he said that different companies funded little brigades with a uniform, and uh, he was very proud. They were very proud. They were funded by what might have become the Oppenheim candy factory in Givat Shaul, and they had really nice uniforms. Um, my daughter wrote about this in fifth grade, and I have to go find her avodah on her family. Oh, that's so uh, interesting. But it's such a lovely thing to just give you for this, for your, for your presentation, so. Wow, Lauren, thank you. You're welcome. Ani, can you see the movies now? Can you order the movies? What are the movies? There's a movie at Castell, isn't there? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Ah, okay, so, um, no, you cannot right. right now. Okay. But, I, I just, yeah. um, you should definitely go, if you're going to guide there, I suggest people go there in advance. You must go there in advance in order to learn the, the way it is. Um, right. It's, it's confusing. Also, check the movies out because they're not, not all the movies are appropriate for families with, for young children. Um, there's one movie I particularly love, but it is um, it's, uh, descriptive or whatever we want to call it. Judy, thank you, actually. Um, I'm glad that you said that because I forgot to mention it. Um, I agree with Judy. By the way, the movies are not running now, but I've seen them before. I would not show the movie at the top to young children. It is rather graphic. graphic um, the, other right. thing is, the other thing that's really important to note, because it's misleading, is when you go up to pay, there is um, a ramp, and you think, oh, wow, this is a wheelchair accessible site. It is not a wheelchair accessible site. No. Um, it's, you're walking on like a hiking path, basically, and it's rutted. I would not try to do it. And at the top, it's all steps. So this is, you can see the movie at the bottom to get a flavor, but you cannot take people in a wheelchair. And I would actually say that people who have any kind of mobility issues, I wouldn't recommend it. And the other thing that's important to note is, um, just as a technical thing, there are trenches at the top. And I want to be sensitive here, so bear with me. Because I had younger kids and older people, and the older people really wanted to hear facts, and younger kids didn't want to run around, they could run in the trenches. The parents could keep an eye on them, and they could also hear a little bit more in depth about what was going. So, you know, you have to decide what you're comfortable with. But for me, I found it as a good way for the adults to hear what they wanted to hear while the kids weren't sitting there going, Mommy, when are we going to go get ice cream? So... There's something else on there. I think there's only bathrooms down below, right? There's no That's bathrooms true. up on top? There are no bathrooms at the top. That's important, too. I, um, I, I would also say that... Um, what was I going to say? Um, that in terms of guiding there, which I just lost... Oh, the, the activities you mentioned, that they have the group activities, they're hard to understand what, how to do it, I found. They have one where you have to take logs and it's a group effort moving logs. And it's a little bit, it, there's no, there's no, the explanation is not so clear in my opinion. Um, and so there were only, there are three group activities. 
There's the three that I'm aware of. Right. And honestly, what I did, I, I guess I was a little bit lucky. There weren't a lot of people there. I was there with a the family, and I asked somebody to just spend a little time with us to get us started. But you're so right. Can, can you describe how the activities are? What the activities are? One of them, I will try. And um, uh, one of them is boards. And you have to move the board so that you can walk from one end to the other. And I know that I'm not being... It's you like a balance beam. Okay, it's like a balance beam. It's like four balance beams, and you have to go from one to the other, but you're also transporting logs or something, boards. And that's one game. That's one. But it basically, it's cooperation, how to work together with other people. And there's also a timer if you want to do it in a certain amount of time. There's a timer there. Ooh, that's for hardcore. <laughs> so, so, don't, so don't put the timer on. Yeah. Also, the, sec the second activity was you're in different islands. And you have to get from one to the other. Right. Um, it is, it, I had a hard time that I really, I just grabbed somebody. But you, that's a site, I think... Um, I think it's true in general, but at Castel, I don't think there is any way to guide it unless you're really um, familiar with it. The other thing that I will say to you is make sure that the clients are wearing sunscreen and hats, but the breeze at the top is, beautiful. is just gorgeous. I, I was there at one o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, gosh. Hot. Yeah, but um, I, I really, I intentionally went, I wanted to go with the hottest part of the day because sometimes we can't control when we're in sites. Um, and this, the breeze was magnificent. Um, you can't, by the way, they've got ice cream and water and all of that stuff. The bottom of the bathrooms are very clean. Yeah. Uh, Ani, I also, if I do remember, I guided it, I think, two and a half years ago. There is a trench or a cave that you can walk through with uh, blinding lights and <laughs> yes, that's, that's a very good one. That's really excellent. Yeah, it is that really is excellent. excellent. If I can add, when you go on their site and you go to each one of these activities, there is a little film you could click on, and it gives you an explanation of how ah. to do it. Oh, Adina, oh. thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask. On those films, because I can't remember from the last time I was there, are there subtitles? Yes. Yes, yes, it's in English yes. also. Uh -huh. It's English. All it's subtitled, it's not dubbed, Sandy. Oh, that's great. All the movies also, when there's movies. Yes, yes. The one if I'm not yeah. mistaken, you have an option of taking it in Hebrew or English. I don't think you need subtitles. There's a button there when you walk in. And right. It's at the Jews. bottom, but I think... I think the one at the top, I think, is subtitled. Uh, I, okay, my memory's not great, but I think I... I'm, I'm, well, I, I, mean, I prefer the subtitles so I don't have to translate it. In I know. That's a, that's a different story. I just maybe thank you. Maybe, maybe thank you to tell me. over, or we can do a trip there. I think that would okay. be... I can help arrange that. I'm good. Thank really you for... Yeah. Right there. I'm so glad that you mentioned it, because that it, I've guided when that's on, but because now <laughs> those things are closed off, yeah. and sometimes about not having shade i had a group of taglit there and the kid that drank the most water he got so dehydrated we had to send him to the hospital but he like you have to drink so much water we were there smack in the middle of the summer it was really um yeah it was i find i find a nice day with a with you know a small group or a couple of people you can combine that with wineries it's so overwhelming to, to really tell the story there and talk about the war and stuff. Then you have some wine. That's a really good combo. <laughs> and I did it. I did it with the cemetery across the street and told stories about the different fighters. I'm, I'm sorry? When I did it, it was a, like Yom Zikaron or something, and they wanted something like that. So I went to the cemetery across the street and told all the stories there. So that was my oh, combination. Wow. And then Latrun. Yeah. I think it's, 
uh, Deborah, getting back to what you said and what Adina said, to do Latrune, Castel, and a winery. Exactly. Or two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or three. <laughs> or three. <laughs> I am. You know yeah. what? I did, I did exactly that. I did like two or three wineries, Latrune and Castel, and it was a fabulous day. Yeah. Really good. Oh, and, and, we and just remember, if you have little kids, you're not far from Suba, and you can do chocolate at Suba at that point. Is Cape Suba still running? I have no idea. I don't know. I, I would kind of doubt it right now, but... Yeah. Um, thank you, Ani. Thank you. I'll send the link uh, to Judy. And again, thank I just you, hope Annie. everybody in your families you, are Annie. healthy. My pleasure. Have a great day, everybody. Judy, thank you. Oh, Annie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Guys, tomorrow, we have another one. Take care. And an easy fast, whoever's fasting. Amen. <laughs>